Okay, so good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Weir, and I'm the Alumni Relations Officer for the UCD College of Social Sciences. You're all very welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 22nd edition of UCD In Conversation. Uh, through this series, we welcome our alumni community from around the world to listen as fellow alumni, UCD academics and guests share their stories and ideas with us. The series also reflects UCD's Rising to the Future strategy and its four strategic themes, which are cre creating a sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world and empowering humanity. So to mark the week of International Women's Day, the UCD alumni team are delighted to have Frances Fitzgerald MEP join us to discuss her European Parliament report, The Gender Perspective in the COVID-19 Crisis and Post-Crisis Period with Ursula Barry, Professor of Gender Studies at the Centre for Gender, Feminisms and Sexualities at UCD. This evening's format will be a 45 minute conversation followed by a short Q&A We'll aim to wrap up before 8 p.m. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the conversation using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Your questions help us to connect and make the format more personal, so please do submit them. We will get to as many as we can at the end of the conversation, but please note that we may not have time to answer every question. And if for whatever reason you have to leave the conversation early or have a problem with connectivity, don't worry. We're recording this session and it will be available on the UCD alumni channel very soon. So now it's my pleasure to hand over to Professor Barry for this evening's conversation on the gender impacts of COVID-19. Thank you, um, thank you, John. Um, uh, I'm Ursula Barry and I'm very happy to be with you tonight. And um, so I'd like to add my words of welcome to everyone who is joining us this evening. And I hope it's gonna be a hugely interesting discussion because it's a highly relevant and um, extremely important topic. Um, that's looking, taking or applying a gender perspective uh, to our understanding of COVID-19. So I'm delighted um, to be able to welcome Frances Fitzgerald, MEP, um, to the conversation. Um, Frances is 20 years uh, as a public representative um, for Fine Gael in Dublin. She's been a member of the Dáil, a member of the opposition. She's been a front bench spokesperson. She's been a Minister of State for Children and Youth Affairs. She's been a Senior Minister for Business Innovation and Enterprise and Justice and Equality. She's been Tanisha, and she is currently a member of the European Parliament representing Dublin. But before she was a public representative in um, the Dáil and the Shannon, uh, and the Dáil, sorry, and uh, the European Parliament, she had an extremely significant role in, um, in the NGO sector and in civic society. She was chairperson of the National Women's Council of Ireland, representative body for, for women in Ireland, and she's also been vice president of the European Women's Lobby. Um, she is currently in the European Parliament and she's a member of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee and also a member of the European Rights and Equality uh, Committee. She was um, elected in 2019 as the European People's Party coordinator of the European Parliament's FEM Committee and has played a key role in the production of the European Union, uh, European Parliament report that we are focused on this evening. The title of the report is Gender Perspective on the COVID-19 Crisis and Post-Crisis Period. And this report has been adopted by a huge majority of the European Parliament in January 2021. And Francis, you acted as a rapporteur for the European Parliament Femme Committee in the production of this report. So could you outline your role as coordinator of the European Parliament Femme Committee and particularly what was involved in your central role as rapporteur for this report. Well, thanks very much. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Ursula. Great to be back in uh, UCD, even virtually. Uh, fantastic memories of doing my social science degree and indeed you were going over my career there. I have to say that everything I did in social science helped me right the way along my career, even right up to justice. I have great memories of, you know, the lectures and what I learned in UCD and very good memories altogether. So it's it's lovely to have been invited to have this conversation with you, Ursula. And of course, um, I've done what I've done with the help of a lot of other women and men and uh, including the work that you've been doing yourself, Ursula, over many years years as well uh, on equality and social issues. So I am uh, in the European Parliament a year and a half and 
I'm very interested in equality. I've always worked on equality, uh, diversity and inclusion. And the FAM committee, I'm um, the coordinator for my group, which is the EPP, European People's Party Group. And I'm the coordinator, uh, coordinator on the Women's Rights Committee. And in that capacity, we were discussing as a group, cross party, all the parties in the parliament, what we should do in relation to COVID. And it was becoming very clear that it was impacting on people differentially. So more older men were dying, um, more women were at the front line, and I'll talk to you about that. Um, we were seeing the socioeconomic impacts uh, being uh, different for women and men. And of course, uh, the very glaring issue in relation to violence. So the research was beginning to come in. And what I do want to say, Ursula, is this is the beginning of looking at the uh, differential impact. It's something we're going to have to continue to do. And it's one of the recommendations in my report about collecting, you know, uh, gender disaggregated data. So um, I was asked to do the report. And the way you do a report in the European Parliament is that you and your team, you know, work on the research, work on the data, you link with the commission, the data they have, uh, the, the parliament, uh, various offices are very helpful to you. You pull all the statistics that you can on the research currently available for groups like EIGE, uh, which are fabulous data on women, I have to say, and they helped us along the way. Then there's a, a it's a long committee procedure. I worked on it for a year. And um, you take a lot of amendments. We had hundreds of amendments from all of the parties. So it really does represent, I think, the best thinking, not just of my group, but of the socialists, of the left, of the right. And you can see from the support it got that everybody agreed. This is an area that is important to examine, important to look at the implications for, uh, for women uh, going into COVID, but coming out of COVID. We went in unequal. You've got to be really careful how we're going to come out of it uh, uh, right across Europe. That sounds like a phenomenal job to have been able to achieve that kind of cross-party support um, and, and, and uh, on, a gender, uh, on a gender equality issue um, and able to bring those parties together. And I can imagine um, the detailed work that goes into considering each of those amendments um, yes. and the case that's been put for and against and, and all of what that involves. Um, so I can imagine that. Can you say a little bit more about what, what is the kind of differential impact that you're seeing um, on COVID-19 uh, uh, on women and men? What, what's the shape that that's taken? in a day-to-day yes. -day basis. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right about, you know, trying to get compromises. It's the one thing I've seen. I, I always knew it about Europe, but when you're trying to tease out compromises and get support, it, it, it's quite difficult. You end up voting on words here and there. So mm -hmm. it is the result of all of that, Ursula, as you say. The differential impact, I, I suppose you have to start by saying women and men went into the pandemic in a differential state, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we know we know that uh, great strides in many areas in equality, but still huge issues of inequality in Europe as well as across uh, the world. So that's the that's the starting point to say that we, you know we were in an unequal position going into the pandemic. What the pandemic has done has really highlighted. Let me talk about a number of areas. I examine about six areas, but let me let me begin by by talking about who's been doing the care work that has been so essential uh, during COVID. Who's been doing that? What, what do we know about that? And what we know is that the statistics are quite extraordinary. Now, I won't over, you know, over elaborate on the statistics, but just to give a few examples, 93% of childcare workers and teachers aides, and we know that the sort of frontline stress has been in our schools, 86% of personal care workers, 95% of domestic cleaners, and think about the focus on cleaning and, you know, whether it's in offices and homes. 76% um, of the 49 million care workers in the EU are women. So the, the possibility of getting the virus in those frontline jobs is very high and more women were getting the virus, but we have to keep monitoring that. Uh, you know, I was in a supermarket today, actually, um, and I looked at the row of cashiers. They were all women. 82% of cashiers across Europe are women. Now, that's very frontline. And, and, and the question that came up for us in examining the report was saying, how do we look after people who do care across Europe? So that's one very significant area. We can talk about that again. 
you then go on to the very striking statistic, which is really very frightening and dreadful. And uh, we're talking again today in the UK and Ireland about violence against women. But right across Europe, no difference in the member states, which is even more disturbing, a 30% increase in domestic violence with people being confined to homes with violent partners, finding it difficult to access help. And we have a lot of recommendations in relation to that. You then go on to the economy and, and you say women, uh, women's work is uh, more precarious very often. Um, women are combining work and family life in and younger men clearly, uh, particularly, playing more of a role in the home. But all of the statistics that came out, the extra care, the extra hours of housework, uh, and so on. And uh, so the economy. Then you look at sexual and reproductive rights and you look what happened to services um, in terms of access to very important health services. We're saying during a pandemic, and if I hope there isn't another pandemic, but during emergencies, how do we look after people who need access to emergency services? And really, the health service has just been trying to cope with this. Um, and a lot of services just closed down. So breast cancer screening closed down. And we know that your chances of dying from breast cancer, from cancers, are actually greater than COVID. You'll catch COVID, you know, easily, obviously, as we know. But listening to the experts in breast cancer care, that's what they tell me. And the big message uh, to women is to go out and get your screening. And there's going to be a huge catch up afterwards. And there are other access to health issues that come up. And then, I, you know, I will say, when you look at the data we have, there's a big problem, Ursula, and you'd know this very well as a professional in the whole social policy area, that over the years, we haven't collected enough gender disaggregated data in any area, and we're going to have to do it in COVID. So the whole picture you get of, of women is of increasing pressures now, I'm not saying there aren't pressures on men in relation to the pandemic. There's pressures on everyone. But there are differential aspects that get ex exacerbated uh, during COVID. And of course, work then, uh, people working at home, combining work, combining housework, and, you know, the traditional roles that women have often taken in terms of childcare, as we know, and indeed housework, despite the changes, the pressures of that during COVID. And of course, I do say uh, that working at home is no substitute for childcare. And that applies for women and men. But the essential, the essential, you know, role that childcare provides, it, it stopped. It wasn't seen as essential. So you begin to pull all of this data together. And what you end up saying is that as we come out of uh, COVID-19 into the recovery, we're definitely, if we're not to increase inequality, going to have to take note uh, of all of these factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've um, brought such uh, huge dramatic figures um, that highlight the way in which the, um, the whole care sector operates um, at both an informal and formal level and, and the way it's so hugely dependent on, on women and women's role. I, I mean, at the er earlier stage of the pandemic, it seemed that um, there was a higher rate of uh, death or mortality among men than among women. Uh, particularly older men, um, but older men that had compromised health conditions of various kinds. Um, but that as, as the situation evolved, you saw um, an increasing no, uh, proportion of care uh, frontline workers, which were primarily women, um, being affected by the virus uh, and getting uh, serious illness uh, for in, in many situations. Um, but, you, you know, um, one of the things that is of huge interest is how the working from home has changed the situation for, uh, for women and men. And um, it's, it's really interesting. I, I thought that, that um, statement you made about working from home is not a substitute for, for childcare. I thought that was usually a um, significant statement because it does seem that um, the loss of, of, of services has put so much of an increased burden on women in the home. And interesting enough, I was looking at um, data over the, the last uh, couple of weeks of the, um, the percentage of women that are the homeschoolers. Now, we're, luckily, we're beginning to go back to school in, in this country, and I'm sure that's a relief for everybody. But that over that period of time, um, women were 90% of the homeschooling hours were being carried out by women. 
um, in the Irish context. And I don't know whether there's um, significant differences that emerge in your report from different European countries. Um, were, were there particular differences like that that you could identify? Not, not hugely, Ursula. I mean, a lot of our data was across Europe and there were striking similarities. Now, if you take care, mm. informal care tends to be more prevalent uh, uh, across Eastern Europe uh, than, for example, in Ireland, even though we still have huge amounts of informal care. But when you look at decision making and voices around COVID, it's a remarkable similarity. Women's voices were missing to quite a degree. Um, it varied. It went up and down a little bit. Um, women's research. Um, we've had a study from the UK saying that uh, women doing research papers, so the numbers had gone down. And I, I, I did a webinar with a group of women uh, executives and they were saying to me, uh, you know, that they really liked working from home. To take up your point about working from home, it gave them, we all know the kind of flexibility it gives you. But then they said they, they were doing all of that, but they were also expected to do more work-wise. So they found that the hours were really adding up. Mm -hmm. um, so across Europe, uh, the, the child care issue varies, as we know somewhat. Um, but in terms of the pandemic, I think there was such shock and it was so serious and we didn't have the vaccinations uh, that I think a lot of what happened, there was huge similarities across Europe. Um, but again, now as we recover, that's where we're really going to have to be very careful. And I, I suppose it does raise questions about uh, the role of men and needing male champions and needing, you know, um, it, it, the things we've always talked about really, you know, work-life balance, um, sharing responsibilities. All of these came even more sharply into focus. And I think they, they showed what was there all along in a more dramatic form in a way and the statistics were proving it, like the one you've just used, Ursula, about education. But this is not, you know, this is not to present women as, you know, as simply as victims. I mean, this is just a reality of much of the life experience of women in terms of care, decision making and so on. And yet we know if we take, for example, the economy, you know, and education, we know the great strides, you know, you know, in UCD, the incredible strides that have been made in terms of female graduates and so on. But again, you know, if you look at the higher decision making echelons and you look at politics and you look at who's making the decisions in relation to the policy around COVID, whose voices are being heard, this is still an issue. Even here in Ireland, we have quite a number of COVID committees in government where there aren't any women. Now, my idea to deal with that is you use different criteria in terms of who you involve. But if you, you know, take it from a hierarchical position, then, of course, you're going to have more men because they're in those positions. But we have huge numbers of public health doctors who are female, for example. So I, I think with a bit of imagination, it doesn't have to be like that. Hierarchically, yes, it, do, it is like that still um, right across. But th there's other interesting things uh, just to mention on a world. If you look at it globally, Ursula, just to. I just finish on this, but just to say that even if you look at the issue of female genital mutilation, and I found this extraordinary, the pandemic means, and I have the figure here, that you could have 2 million more cases of FGM and 13 million more child marriages over the next decade compared to pre-pandemic estimates. And that's because, you know, community services, education services, NGO activity, everything being constrained, and I, it points to a huge need for catch up in the recovery and awareness of these issues. There are the global issues and there are others, but it kind of really brings it home when you think that, you know, progression in these areas is also interrupted by, by the pandemic. So Francis, when, when you look at um, on balance, do you think that the conclusion of, of the report is that existing gender inequalities were exacerbated during the crisis or um, we just brought to the forefront the, the inequalities that were already there. So do you think there's been um, a, a, an increase uh, a, a in inequality or do you think we just it's more visible? Uh, it's kind of both in a way. Uh, it's certainly an increase uh, in, in various areas. I mean, as I said, you know, absolutely clear statistics on the domestic violence, which is really scary. Mm -hmm. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, when I started working in equality, I really thought with education, support services, you know, information, education and getting the word out there, we wouldn't see 
domestic violence and you know sexual harassment instead we have new cyber crime we have uh, harassment online and so on so i i think gender issues are still very challenging in our world you know and there is that everyday sexism as well we have to watch out for um huge improvements better awareness in lots of places but i think it has been uh, exacerbated during uh, COVID. I don't think there's any doubt about that because of the particular circumstances. And it is ho also highlighted, you know, cultural positioning of women, I think. Um, and, and it's highlighted as well, that even though we clap the carers, that actually we, when it comes to what society values, um, we, we don't actually put the money in there. And Joe Biden says, you know, don't tell me what you value. Uh, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. And I, I just think women and women's organisations particularly and researchers have spoken about care. But I think now what we have to do is we have to look at a care economy because you could really um, build a care economy that potentially could, you know, qu add quite a lot to our GDP. Um, but it's never thought of. But you really could do that. Um, you think automatically in the recovery of construction, you know, let's get construction back. But to actually begin to invest in a care economy, um, as opposed to either migrants doing care, um, you know, doing amazing jobs, often very low pay or no career, you know, paths built into it, no training. Um, I think there's great scope. And um, I know that the Citizens Assembly here is, is looking at this here. And I did send my report to them and they'll be making recommendations. And the government has promised a care commission. And I think it's really time now uh, to move to a European care strategy. We don't even have the data, Ursula, across Europe on who's doing the care. You know, we, I think the European, one of the things the European Commission is good at doing, the European Union, is having best practice networks, gathering data of, you know, who is actually doing the care? What's the, what's the value of it to, to an economy being sort of strictly economical about it, not to mind personal or social? So I think there's, you know, there's, this is a values issue that we've got to start getting right um, as, as we uh, go post recovery. I'm, I'm going to come back to the uh, care economy um, in a moment, but I just want to uh, come back to the gender-based violence the thing that you, uh, the whole issue of gender-based violence that you have um, highlighted in the report, which is hugely important. And that 30% increase in, in the incidence of, of gender-based violence or the reporting of gender-based violence that is, is evident. Um, and I was wondering to what extent do you think there is um, an e there's a potential for an EU framework around gender-based violence and, and what, what the content of that should be um, and the role of the EU uh, in, in trying to drive a, a different situation in terms of addressing gender-based violence? Well, we have a, a mechanism at the moment. It's called the Istanbul Convention. Mm -hmm. uh, and that outlines what, you know, really every member state can do. Interestingly, five countries haven't ratified it. And I was quite shocked when I was elected to really get a better understanding of this. And it's actually, it's some of the Eastern European countries, and they're very concerned that it's what they, they see it as almost like um, an intrusion on the member state's competence, but they also see it as a kind of a Trojan horse for LGBTQI rights, um, which they're extremely ambivalent about and often against, as we've seen in Poland. And um, this, I, I have been shocked by this. And also they don't want to use uh, the phrase gender equality. And they have stopped the prime ministers of Europe, if you can believe it, at council meetings using the phrase gender equality, because they think it's all about wanting to introduce a concept of fluidity uh, in, 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 into male, female and into the uh, and, and the idea like that there might be a continuum of some sort, God forbid, um, you know, that it would really sort of, you know, uh, damage the whole of society. So I've been very shocked by that, I have to say. But I think Europe can lead on this. And we, we also could uh, treat uh, violence against women as a, a Euro crime, a European crime. And I think there's a lot uh, that the Commission can do in terms of, uh, and the member states, of course, primarily the member states, but Europe can provide the framework, can provide some of the funding. And I do believe that um, the recovery money that's been given to member states can be used. Every country, including Ireland, has to submit plans by April for the recovery. And 
Europe, by the way, has never given as much money to member states. I mean, through the euro bonds, it's, it's incredible. Unlike the financial crisis, Europe has really poured money into the member states. And we can see that all around us uh, with the payments and the supports to business. So some of that money must be used to develop you know, services uh, for victims of abuse, of domestic violence, and of course the care issue, but domestic violence. So I think that Europe, we also can do a lot on trafficking. We've had a, a wonderful woman who was working as, as the, uh, uh, the, the EU expert on trafficking, and she was doing a lot of work with criminal justice agencies. I think the criminal justice agencies, uh, Europe can really promote best practice, training, um, because that's a very important part. And I think on Garda Shikona here have really made great strides uh, with the work that they've done. And I saw it myself as Minister for Justice, and I think they're improving all the time in terms of reaching out. Uh, but the problem is, if you're in the middle of a pandemic, how do you reach out for help? Uh, it, it, it's, it's a very difficult one. But I, I do think there's an awful lot that... Um, I think if we can't get these countries to support the Istanbul Convention, uh, that we're going to have to move on EU legislation on violence against women. Um, you know, uh, and this will have to be a directive that will have to be implemented. I think that's a very interesting proposition. And I think the points you make about um, uh, some of the countries in Europe where right-wing politics have been particularly um, on, on the up, in Poland and Hungary, and they've taken uh, a lot from um, the whole gender ideology issue that has been generated from Trump America and, and, and all of that, and it's um, it come, come across um, to Europe. Um, and and it, it's evident, it's evident in anti-LGBT, um, LGBTQ positions, and it's also the whole uh, issue of, it, of gender has been made um, uh, a political issue in, in the very language that we use. So I think um, that's important. And I think it's really important also your idea of Euro crimes and your idea of um, there being uh, potentially a directive on, on violence against women or gender-based violence, uh, we should call it. Um, I, I think that's a very interesting proposition. So I'm going to come, come back to your uh, emphasis also on the care economy, because that is the central area that the, um, the report has highlighted to a, a huge degree. And you there are some recommendations in the report. Um, so th there is a recommendation on the need for data around carers, and you've, you've raised that issue yourself. But the idea of a European care strategy, um, and I suppose the, the question is, what would be the main components of that? If, if you have a care strategy, do you envisage um, European funds be made available for child and elder care infrastructure in member states? Or um, do you see, do you see uh, how that could be um, applied across Europe? Would it be um, that kind of um, the public provision of uh, child and elder care uh, across Europe? Would that be the kind of thing you'd be thinking of? Or a statutory right to care? Do you I, see that? Uh, it's... Um... You know, what the European Union, we, we come up against here what the European Union does at a, at a European level, if you like, and what's the competence of member states. And we've seen with health that it's only by agreement to the member states that the EU has moved into helping with, you know, PPE, that's helping with the vaccinations, despite some difficulties. And um, if you take health, um, Ursula, I mean, really, if you want to combat cancer, for example, we really need to pool the resources of Europe on research, on access to medicine, on innovation and so on. A bit like care, uh, the situation varies a lot. And that's why I say the first thing we have to do is to collect the disaggregated data, uh, to disaggregate the data and comparable data on the different types of care. So as well as the carers, you know, um, care could include childcare, care for older persons and care for persons with disability, as well as the carers, gender, age, employment status, um, to feed into a study examining the care gap. So that would drive an EU care strategy to begin with. That would take a kind of a holistic approach. Now, I think we'll have to break it down. So next year, the commission is looking at something I'm very worried about, and that is uh, the care, long-term care in residential um, settings. We've seen the problems during the pandemic. 
And I think the whole balance between community services, community care services and residential is something that really needs examination and, and really what, what model do we really want in Ireland and across Europe? And if we want a community care model, what does that involve and what supports? And it seems to me there is there has to be a greater and greater role for the state in terms of supporting carers. So going back uh, to the EU strategy, what you'd be trying to do is you try be trying to improve cooperation and coordination at EU level. And you asked me about funds. I think you would be looking at support both for informal and formal carers. And uh, you'd be looking at cooperation at EU level, together with the efficient use of EU funds. You would be looking at different, you'd be looking at the InvestEU programme, which is able to look at social issues. You'd be looking at that big programme, it's called the Recovery and Resilience uh, Facility, um, which I think all of which could be used because we have a social pillar in the EU and we have a lot of funding coming. But I think it's a, new, a question of what does each member state value in terms of where they're, you know, what are the policy, what are the public demanding, what are the policy priorities? And let's face it, Ursula, there's going to be an awful lot after the pandemic because business, we haven't mentioned business at all. We do speak about women in business. We talk about SMEs and female entrepreneurs. And some of the studies are showing us that they've had to adapt like everybody. They've had to adapt their businesses hugely. They're worried about recovery. And again, this is an area, um, it, it, it is not female only businesses, obviously, or businesses run by women. This applies to SMEs generally are very vulnerable. And that's what we have this InvestEU fund for, uh, which was just agreed in the parliament this week. So look, at it, it can feel as if you're talking about things that are very far away, but this is all money that's actually going to go into member states and our government here are going to have to have their plan. They're going to have to outline what they, how they want the recovery to go, what areas. And I think it's up to all of us to make sure that it's balanced economically and socially and across all of these sectors that we're talking about as well. And I think that that question you, you raise um, about the model of care is hugely important. Uh, like the long-term care needs um, that was highlighted during the during the pandemic, or it continues to be highlighted, um, and and the fact that that we need more decongregated settings, more individualised spaces, more adapted housing, more support for community facilities, all of those things. So you have much more. There there seems to be a desire, a demand for people for more flexible forms of care uh, and different kind of care needs that can be supported in different ways. So it would be important that a, a European care strategy should recognise maybe those flexible ways in which individuals and households, the choices they make around care um, right. and you know, the, the support systems that are then put in place for them. What I would say to you is I, I see more and more support in the parliament and more and more interest. And I've also seen it, interestingly, my own parliamentary party here uh, in Dublin when I attend meetings, because, you know, these issues have just, you know, look, they've just jumped off the pages, haven't they? I mean, it's the lived experience of people now about care, the quality of care. I mean, people with disabilities during the pandemic trying to access outside services, uh, many being cut off because of worry about the pandemic and so on. I mean, hopefully with vaccinations now that we can begin to, you know, uh, to deal with some of those issues but it's been a very tough time and if you think about you know uh, children with special needs and and parents and you know how difficult it is at the best of times uh, but to now have to face it at a, a time when your supports are withdrawn and it's 24-hour care yourself I mean I think the recovery I think we're going to look at it's hard to talk about the recovery now because we're still in the midst of the pandemic and some countries are worse than us. But I think we're going to have to do an awful lot of talking about the supports that will be needed um, across a whole range of areas. I know I've said it already, but I do feel very strongly about it because there is going to be a lot of money around and we have to use it wisely to deal with these real life issues. And that's one of the things that, that, that struck me as well um, from, from your own work and, and when you were launching this report, um, because you're, you, you talked about a, there was a momentum for change or a renewed momentum for change. And you talked about unfinished democracies, you know, um, and, and there was a cause for hope. 
Um, and I thought maybe you could say a little bit about how you see that um, and where you see the hope and where you see um, that renewed sense of a commitment to change, maybe. Um, yeah. I'd yeah. probably start by saying I'm a bit of an optimist myself anyway, you know, um, I always look for where you can move ahead and, you know, I'm, I, I'm always encouraged by, you know, different things. And I think in many ways it is, look, it's never been a better time uh, uh, to be a woman in the world, in some parts of the world. And, uh, you know, Ireland is doing relatively well. There's no question of that. You know, there are difficulties, not denying those for a moment. But if you look at it from a world perspective, um, you know, it, 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 there's uh, many more opportunities, obviously, for women than there ever were. And greater, I suppose, the, you know, greater insight about it. And I, Ursula, I've seen decades, actually, you know, when um, people wouldn't talk about feminism. I think it was about 10 years there when it really was, you know, a dirty word. Uh, whereas I think that has been, you know, um, it's been re-understood, I think, you know, there's a better understanding. I see younger women, you know, very engaged in it. I think the Me Too movement has really brought home these issues. Um, I mean, international global communication, you know, helps us to see what's happening to women around the world. And, you know, we're putting more money into development aid and so on. So I do see, you know, and women's own resilience and women's, you know, education. So all of the, that is clearly, a, you know, a sign of hope, increased economic independence and education. Uh, but a big digital gap, by the way, uh, gender divide, um, which has, we have a 40, I think it's 40% pension gap across Europe. And um, if women don't get into AI in the tech industries, um, that's going to bode very bad for dealing with the, that pension gap. So I think that we really need to deal with that pension. And of course, we have the gender uh, pay gap as well at 14% across Europe. So, and last week, the gender pay um, uh, bill came out from the European Union uh, gender, you know, so we have more transparency. Uh, I, um, that's really good. And we're going to do it in Ireland as well. Um, and that's where firms with over 250 have to publish pay rates and you can't, you don't have to tell an employer, which is a really interesting one, what your previous pay was. It's a, a directive on pay transparency. So, I mean, th th these are interesting times. So that's why, you know, I'm always hopeful. I think we name issues more now. You know, it's about pulling back the curtain, I suppose. Um, and we've seen the past. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not to say there aren't current issues, uh, as I've said. Um, but, I, you know, I think there are all of those different things come together to make me feel that, yes. And I think women are great at supporting other women and we have more male champions as well. So they'd be the kind of things I'd pick out, Ursula, that um, would give me personally a uh, cause for hope, notwithstanding the, the, you know, the challenges that remain and the new ones like, you know, cyber harassment and we, younger women, you know, not wanting to be in politics because it's so hard with what people do to you online. I mean, that's really disturbing. And younger women coming off uh, being online, coming off the internet and so on, because they just can't hack it, you know, it's, it's and, and probably some young men as well, but women seem to get the brunt of, uh, you know, the uh, the sexual harassment. And um, I, I suppose one of the things, just you mentioned the pay transparency bill and um, our directive, that, that's hugely important. I, I, I'm disappointed that it's 250 plus because uh, employers have that would uh, the bill would apply to um, because I think uh, the National Women's Council here has called for uh, companies of 50 rather than 200. Yeah, I, there's always a pressure in Europe. It's very interesting. I've seen this again and again. There's kind of a, a real concern about putting too many demands on business um, yeah. because, you know, you'll interrupt the, the the entrepreneurial kind of spirit if you have too many regulations. That's kind of a, a strong view that you see there. They're always looking for balances and there's quite a big lot of lobbying pressure around it as well. But can I say, it's nothing to stop companies uh, of 50 doing it. Yeah. And I would hope that, you know, the very fact that it becomes more and more like a, a due diligence issue, really. Mm. Um, and I think that we could lead on that in Ireland. I, we'll have to see what the legislation says eventually in Ireland. But I have been involved in discussions on that be, be, before I went uh, to Europe uh, with IBEC. And, I, you know, I found the, the discussions were very good. And I think the best companies, you know, the best companies and the best businesses are moving on due diligence already. They're moving on, you know, pay transparency. But it's extraordinary. You know, when the facts start to be published, it is amazing how it's always women who are paid less yeah um even in the bbc 
also about um, the extent of, about women's involvement in politics. And, and when you look back at your own, um, you know, very extended career um, in politics at, at different levels, um, at, at both uh, Irish and, and European levels now, um, what's, what's your reflection on, on um, your experience as a, a female representation, or a female representative. As you can imagine, there's some things I can say and some things uh, you know I can't say. But no, seriously, um, it's 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 tough. I mean, it's it's it, I, I I'm sort of lucky that I'm you know I found I had a resilience. I mean, severely tested at times, I have to say, and very very stressful and tough. Um, you know, particularly more recent years, but. Um, I overall, um, what I would say about it is that it's worth getting into because, I mean, the privilege for me of being a minister and bringing the values that I had and actually seeing them reflected in legislation that I was able to pioneer, you know, whether it was the marriage equality referendum or the children's rights referendum and the Sexual Offences Act and the Child and Family Relationship Bill. I mean, I was able to bring my social work, and this is why I mentioned UCD in the early years, I was able to bring my insights from 20 years of social work and experience with families and communities and seeing the development of social problems in communities and, you know, in Ballymun and in, 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 in Dublin, in London, working in hospitals as well. You know, I suppose to answer your question, the opportunity to, to bring about change, to influence is a huge privilege. And I think politics is, you know, it's definitely one of the places that you can do it. I know they do say that, you know, when you're on the outside of politics, say working in NGOs, you think all the power is inside in, in uh, you know, in cabinet or wherever in the doll. And then when you're in there, you think all the power is outside because everybody's, you know, pressurizing you to do X, Y or Z. And the truth is, it's a combination, of course. But I mean, I, I would like to see a critical mass of women. I've been in cabinet when there was uh, Joan Burton and myself and Maura Whelan. And then I've been in cabinet when we had five women out of the 15. And it makes a difference. So I'm very keen on critical mass. I'm a big supporter of quotas, temporary and necessary, um, you know, as the UN says. Um, and uh, I, I think you have to have positive action. I'd like to see 50% of women uh, in cabinet because I just think you, the evidence is that you get a, that mix, you know, you get a better mix of, of even of topics, which is quite interesting. You tend to get more social topics when you have more women involved and, um, and, and health uh, topics uh, discussed. And I saw something the other day, which uh, kind of chuffed me a little bit. It said that uh, female, one, one study, it's in a new book that's out about women in poverty. And it said, uh, and you, one study was suggesting that women are more active and do more bills when they're in, in, in uh, Parliament. So I thought that was interesting. And <laughs> my experience is that women do work very, very hard uh, in politics. So overall worthwhile. But you'd want your support. So you'd want your mentors. You'd want your family uh, support, your friends. My friends have been incredibly important to me to help me really um, deal with some of the challenges I've had to deal with in politics. And the online system is particularly... Uh... A hostile environment uh, in a lot of ways these days. Yeah. Well. I know that that's the case for women politicians in, in different countries, including Ireland. But yes. I, I wanted to um, take some of the questions that are, are coming up um, and I wanted to bring some of the participants in more directly. So um, I was going to ask uh, this question um, from this uh, participant. There's been a renewed urgency around women's safety online and in the news. How does Francis here report aligning with those calls for men to take a greater role in conversation around equality. How, how did I, what was the question? How did I yeah, how did the report? You, yes, um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think men in, in relation to equality are a oh. greater role, a potential for a greater role of men. Well, look, at I, I, I think we need leadership for men on this. Um, I, you know, we, we, we talk about greater leadership uh, in relation to violence and all of these other issues. I mean, look, at in a hierarchical political system, I mean, you have to have the political leaders. Now, you know, you have a lot of strong men, quotes, uh, authoritarian men around the world at the moment who, you know, have no feel for gender equality and are very uh, dismissive. But I mean, we, we, we have to see 
Um, and I, I think we're seeing more young men, actually, particularly. Uh, uh, you, you're seeing men across, across a lot of sectors um, leading. You're seeing men in business as well. I mean, it's smart business to involve women, of course, but you are seeing more leadership uh, for business. I think of a firm like Accenture here and that whole project on, on women on walls. And, you know, it's symbolically very important. Um, I see, um, you know, greater focus on equality and diversity across huge numbers of businesses. Um, mm. I think education is really important, getting away from stereotypes. And um, that's very difficult, you know, with, uh, with all of the industries who make so much uh, money uh, out, out of women and out of a stereotyped approach and out of pornography and trafficking. Um, but I, I think there's, we have to work with men on these issues. And I've seen some great initiatives going back over the years in relation to, you know, men challenging domestic violence. And I think it has a great impact when men, uh, you know, do this. And I, I would make the point, Ursula, that I think very often when we're speaking about gender equality, we have to be careful not to be speaking to the converted. We really need to be reaching out you know, to people uh, and, and, and building bridges with different groups uh, to work on these issues. So those are the kind of recommendations that I would be making about, you know, involving a, a men. And I have to say, you know, when I brought in the, um, the, the sexual offences uh, legislation and, you know, criminalised the purchase of sex, one of the pieces of research um, I looked at uh, was in Sweden, uh, where the very fact that they had done the same began to change young men's, there was a study showing that young men's perception of, of prostitution um, had, you know, was changing. And I, you know, that's the kind of thing we have to do. So we, we've got to be in this together. I certainly agree with that. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's also interesting because I think, you know, the whole inequalities in care, um, that's not in the interest of, of, of men either. And I mean, it's in the interest of men to be involved in the whole care process to a much greater degree and I think young men as you said earlier are um taking up those roles yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sometimes you even feel like that you shouldn't be like when you make the sort of statements I've made about care you, you kind of always have to say I mean there are many men who are carers and uh, you know not to forget that for a moment when we're talking about the care situation I'm, I totally agree with you and I think one of the lovely things that's come out in research recently about the pandemic was about uh, dads building more relationships with their, with their kids and how that has been a feature in, in some circumstances, which I'm, you know, makes sense. Um, yeah, I was going to also ask you, because I think it's come up on tonight's news that um, um, the government has found a way to for um, um, the Minister of Justice to be able to take maternity leave. But there's a question in here, uh, what are your thoughts on the fact that female Irish politicians don't currently receive maternity leave? Do we really need a referendum to bring this into practice when women can receive maternity leave in most other professions? Um, yeah. So like, I, I think there was a news item tonight because I didn't, I didn't hear it because we were coming onto this um, webinar, but that um, uh, Helen McEntee, is being, uh, I don't know, they've provided for six months for her. But in local government and in the Dáil generally, there is still an issue of maternity leave. There is, yes. I mean, um, you know, with our system of, you know, PR, our proportional representation system, you know, you don't really have a, the person that might substitute for you is probably the person who wants to take your seat. <laughs> so there's sort of a practical consideration around it. But of course there should be, um, uh, uh, of course there should be um, a leave, you know, in, in all jobs, in all professions. And it's, it's just a question of finding a way. I mean, it kind of shows the old macho kind of, you know, uh, scenarios that we've had in politics for so long, really. And it is, um, Helen will be taking her leave, uh, paid leave, and Heather Humphreys will, you know, move into uh, justice, take over her role there, because you do have to have, you know, obviously um, uh, somebody occupying the position because you've constitutional issues you have to deal with injustice all the time and migration and various things. So um, yes, and, and uh, I think they're also going to give some more support to ministers of state. I know very well, I was in it for three and a half years, this extraordinary busy department, and it is 24 hour, your phone is on 24 hours. Most people probably leave their phones on now anyway, but injustice, you're getting very serious information, you know, very often at night. And um, it's, it's a hugely demanding uh, role. And I, it's great that they've just made a decision and sorted it. And But the problem is uh, the sort of the pipeline around it, what 
what's going to happen to other women uh, in, in, in the doll or whatever. And it's, you know, for both, I, I think you could sort it on a practical level or slow around. You know, I saw one of the uh, Social Democrat women offering to uh, to cover for um, for Helen as well and vote. So, you know, you can make decisions like that. Okay, I'll just bring in another participant. Um, she's asked, uh, this participant asked, what are the immediate steps that we have to consider once society reopens to ensure equality remains an urgent issue? Yes, well, uh, I, I would start with the, the money that's coming in from Europe uh, to, to, to Ireland, and I would start with the Irish government's plans for the recovery. And, uh, you know, we have to make sure that it's a recovery, and I've talk to everybody I can about this, um, that it's a recovery that, you know, takes account of all of these issues. Um, so that's, you know, I think that's the first. It's also about recognising the kind of points I've been making about the, the vulnerabilities uh, around the recovery period of things going, you know, uh, backwards instead of forwards. I think you'll need, um, when you're talking about, say, employment and training and upskilling or changing careers, got to make sure that, you know, the retraining that's involved in that or going back to university, whatever it is, or, or apprenticeships, um, that we're really looking at uh, women, you know, as well as men, uh, that we're building up the childcare that would be needed, um, that we are supporting the entrepreneurs. I mean, it's, it's all of the things I've been talking about, uh, Ursula. I think we have to be very clear that, um, you know, these have to be priorities because, uh, by the way, what I haven't talked about at all, of course, is uh, the economic input uh, to a society. If you actually uh, empower all of your society, including your women, the, the evidence around the contribution uh, to the European economy and the Irish economy, if we were to really do this properly, is quite extraordinary. So we're talking about, you know, huge increases in uh, GDP across Europe, if you get women involved in tech, for example, you're talking about, I know this is hard to believe, but you're talking about a 16 billion annual boost to EU GDP. I mean, quite extraordinary um, if you are to uh, boosting women in STEM, digital and AI. And then if you look at, uh, Christine Lagarde has done a huge amount of work on this. If you look at the, the potential increase in your economy by, you know, giving women the kinds of opportunities to contribute. You're talking about a huge GDP uh, increase by 2050 um, in, uh, in Europe as well. And people never think about equality actually as an economic issue, really. I mean, they do at an individual level, but somehow there's a kind of a blindness about the contribution that it makes at an economic level uh, to the GDP uh, of a country. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, it really does. And we also have the evidence now that, again, Christine Lagarde is great at uh, producing when she was in the IMF, that if you add even one woman to the board of a company, uh, that you see a, an improvement in performance uh, compared to if you have an all male board and directly linked. Uh, you know, it's just an interesting point. Uh, yeah. and, and she's very clear on those uh, st economic statistics and even more so in developing countries. I think, you know, because one of the things that I haven't um, focused on in, in my questions to you this evening is that, um, you know, when you, when you look at that um, in increase in GDP, how it's going to be distributed, because there is the issue about the pandemic and it's uh, in, uh, disproportionate effect on lower income households. Yes. Um, you know, and, and we haven't spoken a lot about that, I, uh, but I know it's very much part of, of the report. Yes. Um, and I just want to raise that one and also to ask you the question about what happens next um, with the report uh, and the core recommendations. What are the next steps uh, after it's been adopted by the European Parliament? Well, basically, um, I mean, this is a report. Um, in, each, uh, in, in, sec in each section, we, we call out what the Commission has to do, um, what the uh, member states have to do and what the prime ministers have to do, the council. And it's about monitoring and follow up. 
And I mean, no doubt we'll go back to that in the parliament. Uh, I would imagine in about perhaps a year's time, we'll, we'll probably do a further report, but we'll also be monitoring it, particularly in the FAM committee and in the employment committee. And I mean, each, uh, I, I have to tell you, there's huge commitment across the parliament amongst everyone who's involved in this report uh, to, to continue to call out the issues and demand action. Um, but I think quite a number of our recommendations are being included in, in, you know, in policies coming from the Commission. So you have the, the, the pay, uh, pay uh, transparency bill just last week. That's one of our recommendations. Um, you're going to have the care strategy next year for long term care. Uh, from the Commission and so on. And I think we'll be able to monitor, uh, the, you know, the health issues. The EU is taking much more of a position, particularly on cancer. Um, so I, and many of our recommendations are going to be included in the various you know, decisions coming from the Commission. And then it's up to people in, in their own MEPs in their own member states and you know, national politicians to really work on the recommendations. And many, there was a discussion in the Dáil actually uh, on these issues uh, and in the Senate just within the last week. And um, many of these points were made in the Dáil. And I expect that to be happening in parliaments across Europe, you know, based not just obviously on, on my report, but on the work and the research that's coming out from the specialist uh, research institutes and from the Commission itself, which is very good on these issues. Well, Francis, we know that we can rely on you to uh, ensure that this report is, is taken forward in all the different ways that you, you highlight. Um, but I want to uh, give you my huge thanks for all your insights and your thinking and your generous uh, sharing of your thoughts with us this evening. Um, it's been uh, hugely interesting. Uh, and I know people are looking for the report to be put up on the site. And I think, John, you could... Um, guarantee that we can do that. Excellent. Thank, so you. thank you very much, Francis. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Ursula. Okay. And so a big thank you to Francia, Francis and Ursula uh, for that really important and uh, empowering discussion. Lots of great questions we just didn't get a chance to uh, get to, unfortunately. But there is so much to take away from all of us, and hopefully there's a lot to be optimistic about from that conversation. So we, I know many people were asking about the report. Uh, so if you'd like to take a look at it in your own time, we're providing a link to the report in the chat box for you now. So do uh, do save that link and take it take it away and enjoy the report in your own in your own time. Just before we wrap up, we have a couple of other, other items to go through. So as many of you will know, UCD is committed to supporting our students, both current and incoming, through this difficult time, whatever their background. Today, over €300,000 has been raised by generous alumni and friends of UCD for the UCD COVID-19 Emergency Fund. Thank you to those of you who have already supported this important cause. If you'd like to support our efforts to provide urgent financial and mental health support to those students who need it most, you can visit the link which has been posted in the chat box for you now. Nominations for this year's UCD Alumni Awards are now open. These awards celebrate the achievements of nine of our exceptional alumni, and we invite you to submit a nomination for this year's awards by heading to the link in the chat. The third episode in our Money Talks series takes place next Thursday, the 18th of March at 12 p.m., featuring mortgage specialist Owen O'Connor, who is also known on Instagram as The Mortgage Guy. Owen will be diving into where to start if you're beginning your mortgage journey. And the link to register in that chat, uh, register for that is in the chat now. And finally, if you've ever dreamed of traveling abroad and working in another country, find out all you need to know in our next career building webinar, what it takes to land a job overseas on Tuesday, 16th of March. The link to register for that chat is now in your window, chat window. So finally, it just remains me to say thank you once again to our speakers, Francis Fitzgerald MEP and Professor Ursula Barry, and to our viewers for being with us this evening, and we look forward to welcoming you to our next event. In the meantime, please stay safe and well, and good night.